grace to you and peace and God our Father and the Lord our Savior Jesus Christ. It is good to be with the people of God on this day of our Lord. I am privileged to be here with you. Uh, again, my name is John Wesleyan. Uh, I have served on the south side of Atlanta in many capacities from uh, being a youth minister at First Presbyterian Church of Jonesboro to uh, doing youth at College Park, then being associate pastor at Fayette Presbyterian Church, uh, and then some years at Middle Tennessee State University as the campus minister uh, for the Presbyterian Student Fellowship there. Came home to be near family, got to go be with the folks in Monroe Presbyterian for a year, and then lo and behold, the Lord plucked me out and said, go to Calvin. Uh, not something I was expecting, and yet... Uh, when somebody gave me the call, I said, that might be fun. <laughs> Little did I know it would also be very challenging. So it is good to be with you here as now no longer the interim executive director of Calvin Center, but the executive director as that interim tag has been removed. So all of you who love Calvin and come out to see us all the time, you're stuck with me for a little while. So uh, I am grateful to be stuck with you. Uh, also, uh, just know this morning that our friend in common, David Manyara, uh, sent his prayers for the congregation and for me uh, via the WhatsApp, uh, saying, I saw you were going to be at McDonough Sunday, just wanted you to know I'm praying for you. Uh, so just wanted to give thanks, as I know you give thanks uh, for David as well, uh, having served here for a time. I just wanted to once again say thank you to the choir uh, just for uh, lifting us up in worship and kind of bringing us into the throne room of God. What a privilege you have to listen to not only the beauty of that music, but the heart that is behind it. I also particularly want to say thanks to Sophie. You all can convey this later uh, for me, but um, her children's message was amazing. Uh, I was asked if I wanted to do the children's message this morning, and I said, I'm preaching on Song of Solomon. No, I don't want to preach <laughs> the children's sermon. I said, I'll leave that to the professional. Let Sophie do that. Um, and boy, uh, if you listen to the message, then you've heard today's sermon already. But with that, let us turn to God's word coming to us from the Song of Solomon, picking up at the eighth verse of chapter two. Listen. It's my beloved. Look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts that they would be acceptable in your sight. For you are our Lord, our rock, our strength, our redeemer. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. That prayer was definitely very, very necessary as I tried to resist taking on Song of Solomon. For Song of Solomon has a way of bringing out maybe a little too much heat or passion to feel very comfortable in the church pew, it seems. And I said, God, I know it's one of the lectionary texts, but there's these other lectionary texts, and wouldn't they be good? And for some reason, the Holy Spirit would not let me off of Song of Solomon. And I said, is it because I'm dealing with a teenager who's entering the dating world? Is that why I need to approach Song of Solomon, and I said in prayer, dear Lord, I hope not. 
And yet, here it is. I tried to argue some more. I said the, the, the title of this section of scripture by scholars is Rhapsody of Spring. A beautiful title, but Lord, we are in the dog days heat of summer. We're a long way from spring. And yet the Holy Spirit persisted. And I said, okay, Lord, what am I going to talk about when it comes to song of songs that will manage to let them ever ask me back to McDonald Presbyterian again? I began to think of the love song that this is. I began to think of how differently we see the world when we're in love. I mean, here, the young woman said, listen, you know, it's just kind of like, ooh, 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 listen, listen. He's coming. I mean, you can just, oh, the butterflies, you can almost, if you really think about it, you know, just that say, listen, my beloved is coming. Many of you know what that's like. Most of you know what that's like. The butterflies start churning. The anxious anticipation, particularly for a person like he was. Because let's face it, this was a man who could jump, leap over mountains. This was a man who was strong and beloved. And, and, and this was a man who could bound over the hills just like a gazelle. In some sense, he sounded like Superman. He could leap over tall buildings, I mean, tall mountains. In some sense, it starts to be a little lost in translation because gazelles and young stags don't sound too romantic to me. So I began to think about how can I get this in a little bit more of a modern context. I mean, he calls her darling. Do people really call each other darling anymore? I mean, you know, if I look on Instagram, I, I hear more babe. You know, you call each other babe or something like that, you know. And I was like, is there darling around anymore? And then I said, you know, there's got to be a good love song out there. And then I turned to a rare poet in our lifetime who happens to be able to play the fool out of a guitar. And, and Ed Sheeran's words began to come into my ears. And I said, I got to look up the lyrics. And sure enough, I looked like the, the lyrics and I'm like, it's from the dude's standpoint, but man, this is, this is a lot like it. He says, well, I found a woman stronger than anyone I know. She shares my dreams. I hope someday I'll share her home. I found a love to carry more than just my secrets, to carry love, to carry children of my own. This is love right here, people. We are still kids, but we're so in love, fighting against all odds. I know there's some of you out there that know the song, and you're just swaying along, even while I, while I sing it. But anyway, fighting against all odds, I know we'll be all right this time. Darling, somebody still uses darling, isn't that awesome? Darling, just hold my hand. Be my girl. I'll be your man. I see my future in your eyes. There it is. There's those butterflies. That are, I mean, they're going full tilt. Baby, I'm dancing in the dark with you between my arms, barefoot on the grass, listening to our favorite song. When I saw you in that dress looking so beautiful, I don't deserve this. But you look perfect tonight. Now, that's a translation I can start getting wrapped around. That, that, you know, maybe it's because my wife and I went to his concert and I've danced to this song. Now that, that begins to speak to me at least. And I began to think about the love story that's there, the love story in the song, the love story that makes us come alive and smile. I began to think of what makes a good love story anyway. So I went where you always go these days when you're looking for answers to questions like that. You Google it, and WikiHow comes up with a great answer. To tell a good love story, according to WikiHow, you need to create strong, multi-dimensional characters 
that encounter substantial obstacles in their quest for love. And I was like, I started thinking, what are the great love stories that, that I've come across in my lifetime? Well, there, I mean, there's the classics, like Casablanca, right? There, there, there's, you know, from, from my age, Top Gun, where we move from the need for speed to, you know, so you're the one, you know, to lost that love and feeling. There's, there's all that kind of stuff going on. There's Sleepless in Seattle. Hmm. But the one that strikes me the most as I read through Song of Solomon is that great love story, Bambi. It begins to be, yes, the season of spring. And even the skunk, Flowers, seems to find him a cute skunkette. Thumper, who learned to not say anything if he couldn't say nice, couldn't say anything, and so he just thumped the ground, and next thing you know, somehow that girl rabbit was impressed. And even Bambi found himself Twitter-pated with the oncoming of spring. We all have favorite love stories. There would be in there a challenge, obstacles, hunters, forest fires. I began to think of each one of those stories, there was some great obstacle, a challenge they had to meet. My favorite love story is no different. It's the story of a young boy, a child who was born in the Congo region of Africa, the son of Presbyterian missionaries. And he grew up kind of in the wilds of Congo, was sent to a boarding school in South Africa a little time, and then for more schooling in the States. And as he grew up, at some point he had made his way as a young adult to Louisiana. And there at Louisiana, around LSU, he found himself going into a five and dime store. And in that five and dime store, you know, you go get your soda, you go get your milkshake, you go get some candy. And, um, you know, I, I happen to know this man, which will come out later, but I, I know for a fact he had a sweet tooth. Um, he, he would hide sweet things away in a certain place that you couldn't get to, which was frustrating. But anyway, he, he had a sweet tooth, but when he walked in this five and dime to get his candy bar, something else happened to him. I don't know if it was spring, but it might as well have been. Because he looked up and behind the counter, as he tells it, was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. He was nervous even going up there to, to, to buy the candy. She didn't pay him much attention. He was just another customer in the store, right? But he walked out thinking, I have to know who she is. And so he decided he would kind of sit around across the street and see if there was a way to figure out who she was and, and where she was going. And so he waited until she got off work and she left. And as she left, she went across this park. And so he didn't want to follow too close, didn't want to be too creepy, I'm sure. But as he followed across the park, he, he was just kind of, just amazed at how beautiful what she was and she got to the edge of the park and rounded a corner and then quickly got on a bus and she was gone out of his life forever or at least until a few days later because he figured out um, forever is a long time and I don't want to be without her forever so I, I need to know who this woman is and so he went back to the store the next day and she wasn't there so we went back the next day and there she was and this time he was prepared because when she left and went across the park, he had a way of following the bus. And he followed the bus. I forget whether it was in car or bike, but he followed the bus. And it went through the town this way and that way. And then it got to a dirt road. And, and at that dirt road, all of a sudden, that most beautiful woman got off the bus. And he started walking down the dirt road. So he casually pulled a little closer to the intersection and watched one house, two house, three house, and four, fourth house. Look, she, yep, I think she went in there. 
know where she, how am I going to meet this woman? So he, being the man he was, he went back home and he began to plan. And he thought, you know, I've been dabbling or thinking about doing some real estate. And you know what? I got an idea. And so the next day or the Saturday that came up after that, he, he went and he drove up, went down the dirt road and pulled up to this fourth house. And there was a man sitting on the porch and he walked up and he said, Sir, have you ever thought about selling this house? It's a great market right now. And he said, No, we're not moving anywhere. I'm not selling this house. He said, Well, you really ought to consider it. I mean, you don't know the value that's out there. And they began to talk. And he said, well, sir, would you at least allow me to look around your house? You know, go with you, and, and could you show me around the house? And so he's walking in and looking for any signs of this beautiful woman. <laughs> she wasn't there. It's like, surely she had to be there. Nope, wasn't there. He's looking around. There's pictures of these four boys, like, everywhere. Not even a picture. Where did she go? And then he walked into this bedroom. And in the mama's bedroom, there she was in a frame, beautiful as she could be. He thought to himself, sir, I should ask this question. What are the dimensions of this room? And then casually said, oh, well, who is that, sir? Oh, that's my daughter, Josephine. Ah, Josephine. Well, he would pursue Josephine and pursue and pursue. He kept coming back, talking to her father, asking more about the house, but each day getting to know the family a bit more until he was familiar enough and in a place where he could ask Josephine to go on a proper date, chaperoned and all. Well, from there, love was in the air. Now, I just want to take a, a minute for any young folks um, just to advise, probably not the best way to go about it these days. You probably get arrested for stalking. But back then, it feels very romantic. So he continued on until he had won her hand. And they had both fallen in love. But there were studies to do. There was work to do. Courses to complete. She was a student at LSU. They had fallen in love, but obstacles would indeed come. There was a war that had begun. And the young man was called to active duty. But they were in love, and they wanted to be married. And so one day before he had to report... He asked her to marry him, and he said, can we do it now? And she said, yes. And so she got with her mother, I believe it was, and got on a, a bus or train and went from LSU, Baton Rouge, to Mobile, Alabama, where they were married right before he got on a ship for his duty with the Coast Guard. It wouldn't be the last joy that they would have. It wouldn't be the last obstacle. They somehow, after the war, made their, cell, made their way to Georgia and lived in Avondale. In their marriage, they began to start having children. Those things kind of happened. And along came the first one. Ah, joy. And then within about the next year, the second one. And within about the next year, the third one. And there was a lot of joy, but there was a lot of obstacle and challenge for all of you who've ever raised young toddlers, you know what I'm talking about. And so they took a little bit of a break, but then the joy just kept on coming. Then came their first boy. And then was another girl, the fourth. And then another boy. And then another boy, their final seven children. And boy, it was a house full of joy. But it was also... A, a, a small, small house. There was this nice big house out front, but they lived in the apartment house in the back that had three bedrooms. One for mom and daddy, one for the boys, and one for the girls. Seven children. 
in a three-bedroom. That's called an obstacle, y'all. I don't know how they stay married, but they did because there was love and there was hope for what was ahead. He became a very good businessman. And they moved to Stone Mountain. They had a little bit bigger house where they began to welcome grandchildren. And my grandparents would welcome us each holiday, oftentimes on Sundays for Sunday dinner, and I think of the house that was filled with such amazing love. I think of the tender way that my grandfather would, would call my grandmother sweetheart. I think of how she would look at him after all those years with just, they were still Twitter painted, y'all. They still had that the thing that just moved them. It had to be love. She used to peel his grapes, people. I mean, his grapes. She, he would make sure that she felt like a princess. I mean, there was nothing better than everybody gathered around. I'm talking about 25 plus grandchildren, children, and everybody all in the same room for Christmas opening the presents one by one. And the presents for my grandmother would come. And you want to talk about some ladies going crazy when the little white box came out. They knew what that was. Woo, it's going to be jewelry, y'all. And it was sparkly. And sometimes it was a long white box, and they knew what that was. That's jewelry, too. That's one of those bracelets. She knew how much she was loved by her husband and by all around. Quite a love story. See, you see things different when there's a great love story. A three-bedroom apartment becomes... A cradle for a family, a family of great joy, even in the midst of challenge. I remember my grandfather knew the greatest love story. He had done well in business, and towards the end of their lives, he sat down and, and told all of us grandchildren and children, he said, you know, I just want you to know like, we have been so blessed. We have all this stuff, but none of it really matters. All of it's just junk. None of it's worth anything if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life. It's worthless. And my grandfather's a little like the preacher up here. He would ramble and go on and on, only he didn't, you know, do voice inflection quite as well as I do, so it was a little bit more monotone. And so, you know, you're trying to be respectful, but everybody would get tired after a while, and heads would start bobbing, and usually about that time, my grandmother would kick in and say some one-liner that everybody would just die laughing. And this time, it was, he was going on, and he's like, y'all, I mean, I'm just telling you, for like the 16th time, stuff is not important. You need to just give everything to Jesus. And she just calmly said, looking over them, and she said, oh dear, the stuff sure is nice though. <laughs> they had a way of loving each other through the obstacles, even the Alzheimer's that would come. And he would sit in and hold her hand, losing her a bit each day. So it seems like we're always, as Ed Sheeran says, fighting against all odds. It seems like as much as the beloved one here speaks of winter and rain that is passing, a new season to come, it seems like the odds still seem stacked against us. One of the reasons I didn't want to take this on is because it was about spring and we're in summer and, 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 and it's about this joy and love and, and we seem to be in this place that a little bit more like winter, even though it's really hot, um, the, the reason it feels like winter is because of all the stuff coming against us. We thought we were finally kind of out of this COVID stuff. The vaccine came along, life was going to go back to normal. 
and the Delta variant has raised its head. The hospitals have begun full again. The pain of overworked healthcare workers, the pain of too many that have lost loved ones to a simple virus. It's easy to let the obstacles mount up and be in our way. It's easy to continue to think winter is upon us and it's never going to leave. It's easy to think the rain is just flooding us out. And yet, there's a different perspective. For as I mentioned earlier, things are different when you're in love. Think of Calvin Center, a place where many of you have come to love Jesus and love one another. A sacred ground, campground, where so many have gathered for summer camp was started in 1960 with that kind of vision and the lake was built and all these buildings were put in place and thousands upon thousands of kids would come to Camp Calvin. Many of them met Jesus for the first time. Many of them fell in love with God's creation and how beautiful and amazing it is. Many of them found out how incredible counselors are. Many would follow as retreats would begin to happen and people would come out and see their marriages restored at a marriage retreat. They would come out as churches and plan for what's next. They would come out for a church picnic, like I did when I was a youngster at Philadelphia Presbyterian in Forest Park. They would come out and experience God's goodness in the place, the joy of splashing around the pool. And yet, as I have been there for two years as the interim, now executive director, you start seeing things a little bit differently. I walked into the office, and after a few weeks, I figured out that we were not in the black. We were very much in the red. This is, doesn't sound like the fun job I thought it was going to be. Okay, we're tightening the belt straps, people, and we're just going to, we're just going to tighten Batten down the hatches, we're going to get through this. And we'd go six, seven months, and we cut the debt in half. And then March of 2020 happened, and along came COVID. And COVID would come, and, and we would begin to get the phone ringing, and it seemed to happen all in one week. And there went this group, and then this group, and then this group, and then this group, and there went, up. Oh, they're starting to cancel can we even do summer camp? I don't know that we can. Can we do fall groups canceling now? That fall group's canceling now. And $500,000 worth of potential revenue exited while our budget was in the red. Furloughs. Loans. You start walking around campus and you start looking at the back of the dining hall and and there's the soffit that is just broken in like 15 different pieces, it seems like. And, and it's just an eyesore, and it's terrible. It's not doing any harm, but it just looks terrible for our guests. The furniture in the conference lodge. I don't know how old it is, but I do know how threadbare it is. I see the stains on the carpet. I see the pool that needs the pump fixed. I, I, I see Geneva is 60 years old and what a glorious facility it's been, but goodness gracious, it needs to be redone. I see the AC units going out and people trying to stay cool, fanning themselves in the summer heat. And all you can do is apologize because the unit can't be replaced. I see problem after problem after problem. It feels like winter. It feels like it's always raining. It feels like it's awful cloudy. And yet a young man named Clark, I keep saying young, but he's, he's you know, a few years younger than me. 
um, and, and but a little closer to my age, so not exactly young, young man. We'll just go with young man. Um, and so that was my favorite thing about being at Monroe is they always referred to me as the young preacher. And so I really love those people. Um, so, uh, but Clark came to Calvin Center, and as he came to Calvin Center, he was bringing his future bride. And he said, we want to have a camp-themed wedding. And I said, why do you want to have a camp-themed camp wedding? And are you sure you want to do it here? And he was like, yeah, I want to come here because I used to come to Calvin. I like, this was my childhood. This was where I feel like I just grew up. This is where, ugh. And he said, I haven't been there in a long time. Can I come out and see everything? And what's, you know, what do you have still? And, and so he came out with his bride-to-be, and I began to show them around. And walking in the dining hall first, he just looked around and goes, oh, this is so awesome. It's so good to be in here. I think that's still the red floor that was there when I came as a kid. And I was like, yeah, I think it is. And then he walked through the back doors of the dining hall, and it's like, wait a second. This used to be a screen porch, and it wasn't this big. I said, yeah, new church development came in here and worked with Calvin, and they got this beautiful lake view room. And it's had, oh, look at that view of the lake. Oh, this is awesome, y'all. Okay. Show, you, show him Geneva, this 1960s facility that needs some help, y'all. And we walk in the main room, he's like, oh, this would be a perfect place for our guests to have a movie night. Yeah, I can't really argue that point with you. Next, we would go around and I would show him, you know, the old cabins. He's like, yeah, those are kind of like the cabins I used to stay at. But I remember the ones I liked the best was like this canvas thing, you know, that, that had like this lean-to kind of thing that we slept on. I said, the Hogan's. He's like, that's it, the Hogan's. Where are they? I said, they're not here anymore. <laughs> well, he looked at this cabin and I was like, those are old cabins like you remember. He's like, yep. Yep, there's storage now. But there's Hicks, and there's Unit 5. He's like, oh, this is so awesome. Y'all have horses now, I hear. Yep, let's go look at the horses. We go look at the horses. Oh, look how beautiful they are. Can we do trail rides? Could it be possible if we do? Yeah, I think you could do trail rides. That'd be awesome. We got this therapeutic riding going, and kids' lives are being touched all the time. Veterans' lives are being touched by these horses and the relationship there. It's incredible. I'm starting to catch his enthusiasm. And then he goes, what I got to see, I got to see the tree house. I got to see the tree house. So we drive back down the road and, and, and down this trail and this trail, and we pass the, the climbing wall that no longer works. We pass, pass the, the high ropes course that no longer exists. We pass the low ropes course. And then we get to the tree house that's totally falling apart. And I was like, see? And he goes, oh, that tree house is awesome. I got to help you rebuild this tree house. We got to have this for when my guests come out here. Oh, I love this place. It's so amazing. You see, everything looks different when it's viewed through love. Everything looks like possibility. Everything looks like the mountains may be in place, but we can spring over them. The hills may be rising in front of us, but we can just skip over those. We can just keep going right along because there is hope. There is hope that springs eternal. I saw a young lady on, on Instagram that said, you know, we're always being told life is short. As if it's this encouragement to grasp all you can because life is short. But y'all, eternity is long. What if we had that viewpoint? Life is short, but eternity is long. What if we're supposed to get in, being prepared for eternity? It means the Alzheimer, the cancer, those things that come, that is short. That is temporal, but there's an eternity to come because the love story doesn't end there, folks. The love story doesn't end with COVID. The love story doesn't end with broken down facilities. The love story just renews and grows back in the earth as the spring comes forth and things begin to bloom and the fruit begins to develop on the trees. We may have to sell a little land, y'all, at Calvin Center. We're trying. But there's fruit coming. 
There's going to be more campers coming to Calvin Center. There's going to be more retreats, more marriages saved, more youth that experience the goodness of God, more people who know how beautiful this world is and that they indeed themselves are a beautiful creation of God. You see, that's you and me. We have a beloved one that is willing to go down every dirt road to get to us, who has pursued us. His name is Jesus. He's the one who gives us hope that springs eternal. In fact, the Apostle John wrote in Revelation chapter 21, figure we were doing Song of Songs, we might as well throw Revelation in there too. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself with them will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more obstacles. There will be no more death. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more COVID. There won't even be the pesky old flu. There won't be any more pneumonia. There won't be any more pulling out of Afghanistan while the place is falling apart and people are getting blown up. There won't be any more economic crisis in places like Venezuela that now uses only dollars because their currency is totally worthless. There won't be any more refugees having to move out far away from their home. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And love will surround it. The winter sometimes seems like it lasts an awful long time, just like the dog days of summer in the south. But it won't last forever. It is a season, and it will have an end. So hear the words of your beloved who calls to you, come and go away with me. Come and know you are my beloved. And you're being dressed beautifully for the time in which the new Jerusalem shall come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand as the beloved of God using the Apostles' Creed as found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh God, we come this day to praise you. To praise you for creating spaces all around us that show us your glory, the trees that reach to the heavens, the rocks and the rivers cry out with your glory if we would only have the perspective to take the time to notice. God, we worship you 
and are in awe before you that you could possibly, possibly come to those who are unworthy when you are so perfect. But we come to you, God, as your beloved, boldly and ask that you would be with us, that you would take our hand and help us to come away and see all that you have for us. That you help us see that which is eternal, not just what is temporal. God, we pray that you would be with each of the people facing an obstacle that are listed in our bulletin insert. You know each heart, you know each need. We ask that your blessing be upon them, that your healing hand would be there when needed, that your comfort of your Holy Spirit would be with each, that they would know your love drawing them forward. God, we pray for the Afghan people who feel insecure. We pray for the women who might be in danger as our troops pull out. We pray for those who experience the pain and violence of the bombings, the attacks that have come in recent weeks. We pray for our own soldiers who try to stand guard, who have been injured, that you would bring them home safely. We mourn with those who have lost loved ones in the conflict, not only there but around the world that we might somehow know peace. We pray for those who are suffering economically, that you would, that you would use that as a way to draw them close to you, that you would sustain them. For those who've had to move far from home, that they would find refuge in you. God, we pray that as you would speak as our beloved, that you would echo in our ears and that we would know your call to generous acts to share the gifts we have been given, to open the hearts to all in need, to stand with God's people, the least, the lost, the little, and the last. We pray this as the one who, in the name of the one who made himself nothing, but that same one who is raised up in which hope springs eternal, the one named Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now bring forward the Lord's tithes and our offerings. 